well, we're about to have a, a, a great session on the organizing that happened in the 1960s and 1970s. Now, we were comparing at breakfast a little bit about where we were. I was born in 1965. Um, so uh, while you all were changing the world, I was still in preschool, I'm afraid. Um, but what an honor to be with folks who are here who were, who were paving the way, who were changing the world, who were with incredible courage tackling uh, homophobia and the other um, challenges that LGBTQ people faced in churches to have folks here who remember those times uh, and who are able to share with us those, mom those memories. What I remember the 60s and the 70s, I'm a 70s and 60s girl, <laughs> is the music, yeah. the radical social justice move movement, music of the 60s and 70s. That music is phenomenal. Stevie Wonder, you know, Bette Midler, who else? Oh, Marvin, Marvin Gaye. Gay. Yeah. We can just call the roll, can't we? <laughs> Wonderful memories of the music of the 60s and the 70s. And so I appreciate that. Yeah. And I'm hoping we're, bring, we're going to hear some of that spirit of revolution yeah, yeah. Uh, in our session this morning. I think, um, I think we're, we're, I we're think about we're there. I think we're ready to turn it over to our, uh, to our first, first plenary session panel. As we think about the history. We're ready. Whoa. Don't be blown away. All right. Two, four, six, eight. Gay is just as good as straight. Three, five, seven, nine. Lesbians are mighty fine. Just trying to see if you remember some of the old songs. Okay. See if you can fill in the blank. Let the sun shine. That's pretty sunshine. Okay. You can get anything you want. Okay, so for the rest of you who don't have a clue about what we're doing, that is why we are doing this plenary. Heather's looking at me like, where did you come from? I'm learning. Yeah, okay. So we are here to do this. Uh, plenary because there was a history before Stonewall with respect to Stonewall, right? But sometimes when the story gets told, it starts with Stonewall. And there's nothing wrong with Stonewall. We, we honor Stonewall, right? And just a little recent flap around whether or not they could fly a flag at a national park in, at Sheridan Square should remind us of the importance of Stonewall. Because the more they're afraid of something, the more, that's how important you know how it is, right? So, uh, but there was something before Stonewall, and that's what we're honoring today. So we've got four different uh, strands that are represented here, and they represent two different strategies. So here's the four strands, the founding of MCC, the founding of Dignity, Bill Johnson's ordination, in the United Church of Christ, and the Council on Religion and the Homosexual. All four of those events, peculiarly, have their origin in the state of California. So there's something cool going on there. And the two strategies are working within the church to change it, and working outside the church altogether to create safe places for queer people, right? So Dignity and MCC saying, well, all that's all well and good, you do your studies, but we're not waiting for you. And the Council on Religion and the Homosexual and the ordination of Bill John Johnson as uh, working within. And we've got a little film clip we're gonna show you. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Um, about one episode in, uh, that started the Council on Religion and the Homosexual from a movie called Lewd and Lascivious. Who likes to be lewd and lascivious? <laughs> okay, that's a reference to the, to the penal code in California. And we have, uh, so we'll hear about this, the, uh, uh, a dance at the California Hall in 1964. So we're gonna watch the film clip just to bring us into the context when it was illegal and immoral to be homosexual.
before America's debate on same-sex marriage, before Harvey Milk became the first American to run for office, boldly declaring he was gay and proud of it, and even before Stonewall and the first gay pride parades. To be gay or lesbian was a crime. Oral copulation carried up to 15 years in state prison. Anal copulation carried up to life imprisonment. You couldn't dance uh, in the bars, you couldn't hold hands in the street. The policeman said, you've been detained for uh, lewd and lascivious conduct. Here were two gay guys with their genitals kicked in. And I said, call the police. And they said, we can't call the police because there's a police that did the kicking. This officer was notorious for beating up gay people. Everybody knew to be on the lookout for him. We took them to the hospital and the hospital wouldn't take them in. The doctor at the ER room said they're dirty, filthy queers. I was so angry at that point. I saw two police officers in the front of a hotel marquee lobby, and I found myself standing on the curb, white knuckled, just loathing and hating them. But a group of ministers held a dance in San Francisco that changed everything. When we got near California Hall, we saw that the police were there taking pictures of people who were going in. I'll take two of these, honey, and give me uh, two of these. Because, you know, cops that are trying to be intimidated. The police had a fit. This idea of men in dresses. The entryway filled up with police. He grabbed me and started hauling me out the front door. And it was the first time in San Francisco history that 500 gay men and women gathered together in one spot, and the police did not know how to handle this. We expected that to happen. We expected the police to overreact. They were escorting people out, and we knew that the reason we were there was, was just to get people out of the dance. The, the, the fun was gone. Um, it had a new purpose. We have to remind ourselves, this is sacred history now, and a lot of people paid pretty heavy prices the same as you do in every civil rights movement. Film with the real person, Chuck Lewis is here. So I'm going to ask Heather to introduce our, uh, to say what I, whatever I didn't cover and get us started. Raise them. All right. And actually, let me go ahead and have you all come up to your seats. Um, right? Let me tell you one of the reasons why I'm excited. I spend most of my time teaching 18 to 22 year olds um, who have the historical memory as is appropriate um, of kind of fruit flies, which is also like why I don't know all the protest song. I was born in 1974. Um, but one of the things I think about a lot is how a lot of the, the, the place and time for, for passing on memories of what has happened before. It's housed within the academic discipline of history. Um, but there needs to be lots more places for storytelling and, and remembrance and telling stories and passing on intergenerational wisdom. And I'm so excited about this conference and so excited about this panel because there's so much of this that we would not know except for talking to folks who can tell us um, kind of the movement activism that they were part of. And um, that's kind of the, the, the way that we have access to that. And I'm, I'm happy that it's happening here and isn't just kind of um, housed in an, in an academic discipline, as useful as that is, but it needs to be, be elsewhere as well. This is sort of like, I know we're getting the, the rock star version of oral history interviews. Um, so, we're going to have the panelists introduce themselves. Would you all briefly, I guess I'm going to sit right here. <laughs> Could we just go down, beginning with Nikki? Um, just your name and, um, and where you're from. I'm Nikki Valdez, and I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Nancy Crody, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm Bill Johnson, and I live in Claremont, California. I'm Chuck Lewis, and I live in San Francisco, California. I'm Frida Smith, and I live in Sutter Creek, California. <laughs> I'm Jim Matulski from Boston. <laughs> and I actually forgot to introduce myself, too, didn't yep. I? I'm Heather White from Tacoma, Washington. Right. 
Thank you all. And I think we're just going to begin by um, going down the row again. And each of these folks have prepared a or thought about one, one kind of introductory story about their involvement, um, about their early involvement. And Nikki, I'm remembering some things you told us about 1964 in San Antonio, Texas. Right. <clears throat> I was hoping somebody else would start back. <laughs> I'm fine, I say. OK. Uh, well, my early involvement, I think, we see, I was born in 1960, not born, came out, <laughs> 1961. Um, and there was nothing that I could say I could rely on for um, advice or uh, support in, in being involved. So I know that... <clears throat> I came out in 61 because I was 21. And I had to wait until I was 21 before I could come out. Because a young woman, Latina, we, wouldn't, we weren't uh, allowed out of our home until then. So I roamed around <coughs> in San Antonio trying different things, doing different jobs. And then um, I met <clears throat> some folks, uh, they were interested in their spiritual being. How, how, how would we um, take the scripture and apply it to our lives? And was it good? Was it bad? Uh, we started meeting in homes, people's homes. We would go and do prayer and read scripture and discuss what we thought the scripture meant for us in our lives. And we kept doing that until one of the people in the group, um, I believe it was Bruce Dorsfer, that um, met Sister Maria Teresa Flores. And he, she said, well, you can come and meet in my space. She was the director of the Catholic Student Center at St. Philip's College. So we started meeting there and still gathering. And then somebody said, you know, I know this priest that we could ask and maybe he would come and do mass or celebrate mass for us. So we said, okay, let's, let's try that. And that was not a good happening for us. <laughs> that we had two priests that came in and both of them were trying to get us to change who we were or go back to the pews and do what follow the uh, church rule about who we were and do repentance. And uh, I don't know if we, you know, he, they thought that this was a sin. So we had to repent for that. Um, then pretty soon after that, I think we met there about Oh, six, seven months, something like that. And um, the Archbishop at the time, Archbishop Fury, did, found out we were meeting there. And this was a no-no. We couldn't meet there. So he called Maria Teresa Flores and asked, told her, not asked, told her that she had to ask us to leave. So we left the space and uh, went back to meeting in homes. Meanwhile, we lost some of the group. Bruce Jarsfer had um, a heart attack, and another uh, guy by the name of Charles Baldwin, he too got sick and had to quit coming. And there was two women, Molly Hoff and Vicki Adelman, and they got dissolution. They just, they got thrown out. They didn't want to come back. So after that, Sister Maria de Flores herself talked to Father Balti Janacek. And um, he said, I can have that group over at the Catholic Student Center at San Antonio College. So she put me in contact put him in contact with me. 
and he offered us space. Now, at this time, there was no one. Um, uh, I got contacted, and um, I made phone calls and told people, you know, Father Balti will allow us to come to his place. Let's do that. But I had, it, it, it was a little bit of trouble getting people back. So I would go to the Catholic Student Center and sit there in the front step and wait until somebody would show up. And for a while there, one, maybe two, they would come and be gone and we didn't see them again. I didn't see them again. And somehow, Bruce Darsford, he was still uh, convalescing, he found his priest, Alex, Father Alex Nagy, and he came and joined me on the front step. So we would sit there, and if people came, we said prayer. Um, he didn't celebrate Mass. It was, for him, he thought we, it would be best to sit and talk and discuss, and he would counsel us and guide us, in trying to keep, give us support so that we wouldn't just give up. Um, but then, I, I, as usual, I would call people and say, we're meeting this Sunday, come and join us. And when they found out, of course, that there was a priest, then they started coming back. Um, there was, um, and then Bruce got well again and came back. And he talked Molly and Vicky into coming back. So our group started to grow. Um, and we had a good safe space. By then, Archbishop Flores was now in, installed. And he was a very pastoral bishop, archbishop, rather. Um, and um, he saw that it was good that we were meeting. And as long as Father Balti was giving us support for staying there, he was OK with us being there. And throughout his tenure, he, that was his attitude. If a priest would allow us to meet at their church, then he would support that. Uh, if the priest was not happy, he would say, well, tell them to move on. So we moved on several times. But anyway, in 1974, 75, we heard of Dignity, that there was a group that was started. And so we wrote um, to them in, I think it was San Diego or Los Angeles, one or the other. And we asked to be part of Dignity. Um, then, uh, of course, they sent correspondents back saying, well, you have to have so many people, at least 10 members, and your fee was like $10 at the time <laughs> to be. <laughs> to be a member of the group. Um, and so we got chartered in 1976. Um, and um, we kept on meeting at uh, the Catholic Student Center until one of our uh, folks, um, Joe Scroggins, he went to St. Patrick's Church in San Antonio and spoke to Father Charles Pugh at the time, he was the vicar general of the diocese. And he, he took us in. And he would even celebrate mass for us at least like once or twice a month. And we started getting priests to come and join us. And we weren't being told you know, that we couldn't be who we were anymore. We were kind of uh, protected. And of course, every time somebody would complained to the archbishop about this group, he would say, well, those folks need to be ministered to also. He was a very good archbishop. We kept, we, we were at St. Patrick's, oh, I, I want to say a good five, six years. It was a very good time for us. Then Father Pugh moved so we had a new priest come in, 
Father Conway, I believe was his name. So, and he, so Nikki, um, we're gonna we're gonna stop there, but we're gonna loop back to you. Okay. okay? So we've got the we've got dignity in well, play. Yeah, we're in place. Okay. <laughs> and now we're gonna we're gonna bring in the United Church of Christ. Can All we right. ap appreciate Nikki? Yes. Thanks for stopping me. I would go on. That's okay. <laughs> no. You're great. So we've got we've got uh, a team here from the UCC, and we're going to have Nancy introduce it with her story from the Baptists. Actually, yes, I started as an American Baptist. Uh, came out of Ohio, went to Ohio State University, the, which we considered to be the buckle of the Bible Belt at that point. Uh, Columbus is now one of the most open cities, but back then it wasn't. Um, let me just first, a quick piece of history, since you're going to hear so much about California down the line here. Um, July 4th, 1965, every July 4th from 65 to 69, there were demonstrations at Independence Hall in Philadelphia, led primarily by Barbara Giddings and Frank Kameny, two of our not church-related saints, but saints of the movement. <laughs> My story begins with leaving Ohio to go to Chester, Pennsylvania, then a somewhat thriving city near Philadelphia, now the poorest city in all of the state of Pennsylvania, to attend Crozier Theological Seminary, which was one of the more liberal of the American Baptist schools, uh, or as we called it occasionally, crazier teleological cemetery. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I was, it was, it was, it's best known as being the, uh, where Martin Luther King Jr. got his Bachelor of Divinity three or four years before I got there. And within the decade of the 60s, moved toward the end of that decade, moved to Rochester to be part of Colgate Rochester Divinity School. At the time, in 62 to 64, that I was there, I was the only woman in any of the classes. Mm -hmm. um, in my middle year, had top grades in the class. The group of women that met, faculty wives and the two student wives who were there, couldn't quite understand why I wasn't interested in joining them to learn about flower arranging and giving teas. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's another story. Um, came the end, toward the end of my second year. Crozier was about to celebrate the following year its centennial. Um, the building, the, the old main, had been the, a Civil War uh, hospital at, in the 60s, 1860s. And in 1965, they were to celebrate a centennial. I was part of a student faculty committee that was asked to make some plans for that event. And our theme was to be community. And naively or stupidly, as a member of that committee, I said at one point, I am distressed that the gay men here at the seminary have to go into the bars in Chester to find community. And I said, I can't talk about them without saying that I too am gay. Lesbian was not part of my vocabulary yet. Uh, faces fell all over the place, and the next thing I knew, the faculty was meeting, and a brand new pastoral psychology type person had just come on the faculty that year and managed to convince all of them that I had to go pronto. Well, the first thing they did was move me out of the dorm. Now, realize Old Main was classrooms, um, offices, cafeteria, chapel, everything on the first floor. Second floor was all the men's rooms. Third floor was the two married couples and mine. So I got moved out of the dorm. Now I'm not quite sure what they thought I was going to do to the guys. But anyway, that was their solution. <laughs> Needless to say, Holy Week for many years after that was sort of a torturous time for me. Mm. Um, but anyway, I was not, I, I still continued in classes and continued my field work jobs. 
But at the end of that year, um, I was effectively out. In um, the first year that I had been there, I had worked in a congregational church nearby, which had taken on the name of United Church of Christ because the denomination had formed only in 1957, a merger of the Congregational Christians and the Evangelical Reformed Church. So in the course of my finding a position after I left there, I ended up working for nine years as a secretary in the Division of Christian Education of the new United Church of Christ. And in the middle 60s, joined a UCC congregation. In effect, I had gone back into the closet after that first rather raucous coming out. Then in 1972, uh, a friend in the church was teaching school next to a young woman who had been a, who had done some time at PSR and knew this guy named Bill Johnson. And she had heard that he was up to no good out there and <laughs> put me in touch with him. <laughs> and, and we ended up then being a foursome at the very first St. Louis 1973 General Synod meeting of the United Church of Christ, where I was the one lesbian of the four of us. And we had signs up in the hotel where we met saying, take a lesbian to lunch. <laughs> well, one, one of my lunch companions is here in this room today, Marilyn Staffinger. <laughs> and the rest is history, which Bill can follow up with here. <laughs> I think we're doing another round, is that true? We will do a yeah. second round, yes. Okay, because I'm not gonna follow up quite yet. No, okay. okay. Um, because I, I wanted to introduce myself by uh, letting you know that like so many people that we've heard from, I was born in Texas. <laughs> and, um, and I was born a twin. My twin is gay too. We didn't acknowledge that we were both gay until we were 24 years old. And I say that to you so that you can get a little bit of a sense of how oppressive the homophobia and the, the, the internalized homophobia was and the external homophobia was. And Texas was not an exceptional place in that regard. That was true all over the, all over the country and probably all over the world. I decided when I was 17 that I wanted to be a minister. And it was shortly after that that, I, that I, someone said to me, well, you know, you can't, be, you can't be like that person in New Orleans who was just arrested in the bathhouse who was the minister of one of our churches. And it, it's interesting the way people sort of danced around the subject, you know. <laughs> But I got the message that what I was, what I was feeling was, would not be okay in the church. This was a big conflict, uh, and I think there are people in this room who've had a similar conflict within your lives about wanting to uh, be a servant leader but uh, realizing that the church was not open to you and your ministry. So I went through college and three years of seminary uh, or two years of seminary with, uh, with a real struggle about how do I reconcile my faith, my vocation, and my human sexuality. Uh, and all of that came to a head. Um, There's a lot of agony and all that, a lot of crying, a lot of questioning, and uh, it, came, it sort of came to a pinnacle point on November 11th 1970, which was the day that I came out publicly as a gay Christian at Pacific School of Religion. And I'm going to stop there because I don't have a great need to talk. And I want Chuck to sort of pick up where we, you know, what was going on in uh, San Francisco in the 60s because that, then I can build upon that story. Life was different back in the 1950s and 1960s. 
In San Francisco at that, in the 1950s, several things happened. One, a number of organizations were developed to support and uh, protect the lesbian and gay community. Bisexuals and transgenders were not really talked about at that point. Those organizations rep represented the Mattachine Society, the Daughters of Belitis, the Coit Society for Individual Rights, and the Tavern Guild. All those organizations competed with one another for their particular membership or what have you. It laid overlaid against this was the very simple fact that the church had became convinced that the white flight that was taking place in the major cities around the, the country had to be dealt with. And so what they did is they appointed various urban specialists in every major city of most of the Protestant denominations to come to those cities and try to develop strategies and ministries that would take place there. I came to San Francisco in 1964 to develop a mission parish in what was then called North Beach, which was uh, essentially halfway between Fisherman's Wharf and what later became the Broadway topless nightclub strip. How's that for a new parish? <laughs> Especially when you come from suburban Chicago to develop this parish. In addition to that, I was also told that, Chuck, there are Gay com there are uh, homosexuals in the area and the beatnik community out there. See what you can do and provide ministry. At the same time, what, <clears throat> what happened is the gay bars were uh, limited to about two years in existence before they were raided by the police department. And then after that, uh, they had to pa pass on their license to someone else. The bars were all had no windows and people entered from back entrances and other such things. It was a very cl closeted society. Ted McAvena from the Glide Methodist Memorial T um, Foundation went into the Tenderloin, a downtown area of San Francisco, and discovered that there were a number of, of gay uh, individuals, particularly young gay men, who were on the streets very angry and very alienated from the church. And together, along with these other urban specialists, they put together something called the Mill Valley Conference, which was held at a UCC uh, conference center in Marin County. It was the first time in history that openly identified gay people and clergy met together for a whole weekend. For the straight clergy who were there, it was a rather anxious time because uh, they weren't sure what was going to happen. So when they went uh, to sleep at night, they locked their doors <laughs> or put a chair against the doorknob. Uh, but out of this came a wonderful conversation that when, the, uh, when it was over, they said, we have got to continue this dialogue into the future. The result was the Council on Religion and the Homosexual. I became a member of that first executive committee and realized that what was happening is these various gay organizations wanted to provide financial support for the, for the <coughs> newly organized CRH and held a dance that was to be held at California Hall on January 1st, 1965. Ted McAvena and uh, Clay Caldwell from the UCC uh, went down to the police department to uh, tell them that the dance would be held and that for the first time in history some 500 uh, individuals who were both gay and lesbian would gather for a dance at California Hall. And in addition to that, there would probably be at least 10 clergy, their wives, girlfriends, or significant others who would also be present. They, were, uh, they thought they were going to be directed to the chief of police so that they could make this announcement. Instead, they were directed to the vice squad. The vice squad asked them such questions as, do you, have you, uh, I see you are wearing a wedding ring. What does your wife have to say about this? Or what does the Bible have to say about this? The dance was held, and that particular night, Joanne Chadwick and myself, Joanne was working with me in my, this new parish, went to the dance at 10 o'clock uh, at night. Uh, 
When we got there, or about quarter to 10, when we got there, what we discovered is that there was a police car at either end of the block and a paddy wagon parked directly across from the, the entrance to California Hall. We walked down the street and discovered that there was a police uh, movie camera operator and a still photographer photographing everybody who entered the dance at that particular time. We walked inside and realized that up until that point, in, in 15 minute intervals, that a squad of police would come in and ask to, for a fire inspection, ask for the liquor license, whether or not it was up to date, and so on. While we were standing there, another squad came in and were challenged by two attorneys that we had on hand and told them that they, this was a private dance that they could not enter. At that point, the two attorneys were then arrested, taken outside. Notes that they had taken were removed from them, and they were accused of uh, moral turpitude as they were arrested on the spot. The result was that uh, in those days, it was the kind of thing that happened is that the American Bar Association was then called and said, we just thought you'd like to know that two of your attorneys have been arrested and you might want to charge them with moral turpitude. Fortunately, the person on the other end said, thank you very much for calling, but we don't think this is any of our goddamn business. <laughs> Later on, another squad came in to make another uh, investigation, and two more attor another attorney and a straight woman who was taking the tickets were also arrested. Later on, at, at another 15-minute interval, a drag show was then hap happening, and the result was two men were standing on folding chairs, and as the vice squad officers came in, they, these men f happened to fall from the chairs. One of them said, one of the vice squad officers said, did you see those two men kiss each other? Person who leading them said, no, you didn't, and neither did I. But they were arrested, and they were arrested for lewd and lascivious conduct. The result was that all of this eventually ended up in a trial uh, in San Francisco, and the uh, judge at that particular time threw the whole case out the window because he asked the question, you said your duty was to get into the uh, California Hall, and did you get in? And they said, well, yes, we did. We were only into the lobby, though. You, did you get in? Well, yes, we... He then instructed the jury to bring back a verdict of not guilty, which they did. He said, what took you so long? They were there for 20 minutes. He said, well, it took us 20 minutes to, to uh, appoint a chair for the whole thing. <laughs> the next thing that happened is that the two men, uh, several weeks later, were then tried, and they were found guilty by the judge because the judge said, the kind of conduct you wish to see on the streets of San Francisco is, will determine the, the uh, verdict that you bring in. They were then fined $250 and... Uh, had to register as sex offenders. One of the men wow. was from Los Angeles. He immediately lost his job when he went home. The other one was from San Francisco. Later on, uh, probably several months later, what happened is we sued, uh, the Tavern Guild sued the city and county of San Francisco for a, a million dollars or what have you. Uh, it was settled out of court Three years later, and the Council on Religion and Homosexual, as a friend of the court, got one dollar out of the whole thing. The result was, however, that the next year, because of this lawsuit, the police department went to the Tavern Guild and said, when you hold your next dance, tell us what you want. Can we block up the street for you? Can we provide any sort of security for you? And that became our stonewall two years prior to Stonewall, which made all the difference in the world in the gay life in San Francisco. That, <clears throat> that story is also told in what you uh, have already been uh, told about, which was a doctoral thesis that was done by Jalen Ricks, and it was, the original story was to be called The Last Dance, but they figured that 
this was not a, a title that was going to attract any very many people, so it was retitled at the end, Lewd and Lascivious. And that <laughs> is available, as I, or will become available, uh, through the Institute here later on. Great, thanks. And then I'm uh, Frida Smith and uh, from Metropolitan Community Church. And uh, I, I would just like for a moment to quote Dog Hammarskjöld, the first Secretary General of the United Nations, when he said, never, never for the sake of tranquility deny the reality of your own experience. Never, never for the sake of tranquility deny the reality of your own experience. I entered Metropolitan Community Church in a, a very surprising way. The assembly, Assemblyman Willie Brown in 1971 introduced uh, legislation into the Assembly of the State of California, a bill that was called the Consenting Adults Bill. Uh, before that time, uh, homosexual acts were uh, punishable by up to 15 years in the state penitentiary, and it was uh, very, very uh, enforced in a lot, of, a lot of cases. That day, the Reverend Troy Perry, 28, well, he was 30 then, I mean, he was all of 30. The Reverend Troy Perry, who had started a small church in uh, Los Angeles, California, decided to march with uh, the people who were, the men, they were all men, who were with him from Oakland, California, up the River Road to Sacramento, and to rally at the state capitol. I happened to be chosen to be the lesbian speaker because uh, uh, from uh, California State University. When I got up to speak, I uh, just let loose on them. <laughs> I, you know, I was so radical. I was so fierce. I, I was just so out of line. Troy, standing behind me, said to Papa John, who was his vice moderator, uh, we need someone like that in Metropolitan Community <laughs> Church. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He knew what he was in for. <laughs> I came bursting into Metropolitan Community Church from that point, was licensed because we didn't have, all we had to do was break laws. That, that's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> but as I spoke, as I said, uh, Reverend Troy Perry said to Papa John, we need her in our uh, church. Uh, Willie Brown, at the same time, introduced the consenting adults law, that we called it the consenting adults law, that decriminalized sexual acts between people of the same sex in private, the consenting adults law. He called it the gay Jim Crow, <laughs> anti-Jim Crow, anti-lynching law. He says, we in the South learned we had to stop them from lynching us before we could go forward. This is the gay anti-lynching lynching law as he introduced it. And as uh, uh, Willie Brown was speaking, uh, you could look out and you could see people starting to look up, looking up. It had been raining earlier that day. They, they, they were looking up. And so Willie Brown looked up, I looked up, everyone looked up, and around the sun, and, and never, never for the sake of tranquility, deny the reality of your own experience. Looking up around the sun was a perfect rainbow. And Willie Brown said, I've heard of gay power, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> I entered into a Metropolitan Community Church right after that. They knew what they were getting. I was at the second general conference in 1971. I've been in Metropolitan Community Church ever since. I've caused problems everywhere I went. And so that wins me a spot up here to talk to you. <laughs> never, never, for the sake of tranquility, deny the reality of your own experience.
time. Excuse us a moment. No. <laughs> We're making this up as we go along, as we all are here, right? One of the. Go ahead. So we've had one good first round from our uh, participants, and we want to give them one more chance to say one more thing about their particular experiences from Dignity, the UCC, the Council on Religion and Homosexual, from MCC. Then we're going to interact with all of you. So be thinking about questions you might want to ask them in particular. Um, but is this not a rich oh. a tapestry? Yeah. So, um, yeah. OK. Showtime. No, um, yeah. One more good story, Nikki. That's what we're looking for, a story. OK. Dignity gradually uh, took shape and increased in purpose. And we held two regional conferences. It was like from Texas all the way to Wyoming. That was our region. And in 1978, 79, our first speaker was Sister Janine Gramick. She came and talked to us um, about um, equality, basically, about using inclusive language and why uh, it was needed and why that would balance things out when women were included. Um, we uh, formalized our constitution and bylaws and um, we were asked when uh, a new uh, pastor came in to move again. So we moved, um, we dusted the dust off our feet and had cameras and, you know, made it a big uh, show that we, and we stood outside the steps of St. Patrick's, dusted our feet and moved on. Um, we, <laughs> from, from then, it was a series of exodus. We moved to San Francisco, um, and uh, we were there like two weeks. And the council there decided they didn't want us there. So even though the priest had invited us, uh, Father Ted Bretagnia invited us to be there, the, the council said, no, we don't want them here. So then we had um, a, another priest, Father Bill Davis, accept us at St. Mary's Church downtown. So we moved down there. And we were there for quite a while. Uh, we were there till the Halloween letter came out when, uh, uh, I forget our Pope's name at that time. I don't want to remember his name anyway. <laughs> but. Yeah. He, he, during that time, we lost. We had like, oh, maybe six priests that would come and do um, liturgy with us, and we lost all of them because they were afraid to be there. Um, they um, were basically told that we sh they sh we shouldn't be ministered to. So we went back to doing our paraliturgies and working out of that. Um, it got to where there was more people up there than in the pews. We uh, lost a lot of people. Um, gradually, with Archbishop Flory still there, he never said, we don't want the group there. He always allowed Father Davis to keep us there if that was okay with him. But then Father Davis had to move. He went to Africa. <clears throat> and a new priest would, took about, it took him about a, one year to ask us to move, but he never wanted us there. Um, I think one Sunday, he would come in actually and sit at the very back and, and see what we were doing. I think he wanted to know, is there anything that church wouldn't, the, the hierarchy wouldn't permit? So that, that they watched us very carefully. They wanted us to slip and make a mistake and he could say, ah, you, you need to leave because you're not doing uh, things according to what the church 
rules are. You know what, Nikki, I'm gonna take a risk here, because I only because I've had the privilege of hearing you talk in our smaller groups and ask you this question. What keeps you going? What keeps you there? You know, because you've been you've been so faithful through all these times that they keep kicking you out, kicking you out, moving you along. But what keeps your fire burning uh, through all these? I think I'm just stubborn. <laughs> but overall, I think. Uh, with the, leader, the, the guidance that the nuns and Father Neji and all the priests that were coming, they would come because they wanted, they saw that there was a need mm -hmm. in the community for um, GLBT folks to be ministered to. Um, and that has always been my driving force, I think. Being part of dignity has made me um, strong enough to say, "This is you. You baptized me. I am Catholic. Yeah. I'm here to stay, yeah. and you you can't just disown me just like that." Yeah. And that feeling that I got from. Being, feeling empowered by dignity and the, everybody around me, I wanted that feeling for others, for the other gay people and lesbians, and um, that they would get the same feeling of belonging. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to move it back to Nancy and and. And then to Bill. I'm going to defer to Bill to tell his story next. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Nancy. <laughs> After I came out in November of 1970 at Pacific School of Religion, I hooked up with a couple of interesting organizations. One was the National Sex Forum at Glide Memorial Church. And the other was the Council on Religion and the Homosexual, where I met this fine gentleman. Well, we've known each other a long time. That's for sure. And I also met my three feminist um, mentors, Del Martin, Phyllis Lyon, and Sally Miller Gerhardt. I came out, uh, after I came out at seminary, uh, the United Church of Christ was on notice that I intended to ask for ordination, which completely freaked them out. Uh, there's a little story about the, the Northern California Conference minister in the United Church standing next to the United Methodist Conference minister on the night that I came out uh, at a public event at Pacific School of Religion, and the Methodist bishop, I guess, the, bish the bishop turned to our conference minister and said, better you than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, I graduated in 1971, but I was uh, not approved for ordination until April of 1972. Uh, at an ecclesiastical council, some of you may already know the story, there were 96 voting delegates uh, at the event where I had to present my paper and be questioned, and um, the vote at the end of the day was 62 to 34 that I should be ordained. The interesting thing is that the lay members of the church voted in a stronger majority than did the clergy. Mm. That's not surprising to me, and shouldn't be surprising to you. Uh, numerous clergy at, since have apologized to me. I actually have three neighbors right now, we're in the retirement community where I live, who actually voted against my ordination. <laughs> and they've all apologized for, for their wrongheadedness. Um, and a couple of them came out to me as gay people, but that's another. <laughs> That's really another whole 
drama, really. So I was ordained in June of 1972, and in December of 1972, I founded the United Church of Christ Gay Caucus. The Gay Caucus, which today is called the UCC uh, Open and Affirming Coalition, was officially recognized by the United Church of Christ, but it was not funded. From its very inception, the coalition, the caucus, the coalition, has been uh, funded by its members and friends. Uh, and that is still true today. Um, now, in the United Church of Christ, our polity, our governance structure, gives us a lot of freedom. Um, we can initiate actions that are consistent with the United Church of Christ's long history of justice advocacy. Um, but nobody has to do anything we ask them to do. On the other hand, they can't tell us what to do. But because of this dynamic of this, this freedom um, in which the local church is the final authority in the United Church of Christ and all the other relationships are covenantal, um, the coalition focused initially and still does on pastoral care because there was a great deal of need among church people, uh, church members, for pastoral care. Not just the LGBT people, but our family members as well. Um, so pastoral care was a high priority. Education was another high priority. Uh, I, was, I was blessed uh, in that I have a doctorate degree in human sexuality education. So I was also able to mix my theolo theology, my churchiness uh, with some, you know, real knowledge about human sexuality. Uh, in other words, I was a force to be reckoned with. Um, and the third, the third, sort of the third part of the footstool uh, was advocacy, justice advocacy. And we sort of went whole hog on that one. Uh, we, we went to our first national meeting in the United Church of Christ in 1973, and um, as Lowy mentioned last night, we had a resolution on the, uh, submitted for the, for the General Senate to consider, but they didn't consider it. Two years later, we went back with a major pronouncement about civil liberties, and it, we got it adopted uh, by the 700-something delegates to the General Senate. And what happened in those two years was we had done very, we had done our work very well, and our, our initial work was finding each other, finding each other and identifying what the issues were that we needed to address. And it was interesting because as coordinator of the, of the Gay Caucus, I would get phone calls or letters, there was no email, um, from local church pastors who would say, I have a homosexual in my congregation. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> and, and of course the answer is quite simple. You do whatever you would do with any member of your congregation. You provide pastoral care, you provide loving support. Um, now I wanna say that one of the things that is I think unique about the United Church of Christ is because of our long history is that we, uh, in you know, our history goes back to the 18th century, but even though the church was founded in 1957. But it involves uh, um, the abolition movement. It involves uh, advocacy for women. The first woman ever ordained was ordained in the United Church of Christ. And so our, our efforts um, were historically in line with what the United Church of Christ has always been about. Part of the fun of being in, the, I'm gonna sort of ad lib now, but part of the fun of being in the, in the movement, in the LGBT <laughs> religious movement at that time was we got to meet people like Frida Smith, you know? And we, it's sort of interesting, because we all knew each other back in, back in the days when we were full of vinegar. 
And, uh, <laughs> and we had, there were times when it was pretty crucial and I mean pretty critical and we, we were able to have a lot of fun and be supportive of each other. I think that was one of the wonderful things about the early movement in the church is that across <laughs> denominational lines, we were able to communicate and share strategies and talk about problems and develop strategies together and give one another not only organizational support, but we gave each other personal support. <laughs> you know, and as a result of that, we actually started loving each other. And we love each other still. Amen. Mm -hmm. And there are people in this room, as you know, uh, who were involved in all those years. And it's, it's been amazing to be here and be able to reconnect with people that we knew in those earliest years of the LGBT religious movement um, and to recall um, how, how much affection that we actually had then and still have for yeah. one another and respect for one another. Though we were all doing very different things because our situations were very different. You know, the Methodists were dealing with something very different than what the UCC people were dealing with. And the American Baptists were dealing with something that was very different than what the UCC people were doing. But it was, there, was, there was a community of genuine caring and support in the early part of the movement. And I, I don't know because I'm retired and I don't stay up on things, but um, I have to say that I don't know to what extent that is still true. And this extends, of course, across the board to dignity and, and uh, to MCC and, and even to much smaller groups like the, like the Mennonite Brethren Council. And, uh, uh, I'm going to use that to toss one more to Frida before we go to the group, which is what's something working on the outside, on the margins in a sense, that you could do, Frida, that, that couldn't happen, uh, that didn't happen on the main okay. line? In the main line, if you will. Oh, yeah, we, word, we were line, never main line. Yeah. Uh, I left you on the state, uh, except for the state capitol. That, uh, in, uh, in, uh, that year, I showed up at the second general conference of metropolitan community churches. And uh, Bill, I mean, <laughs> Jim Sandmeyer. Uh, from San Francisco was uh, the chair of uh, the coordination uh, the social, you know, outreach, and he asked me to speak to that conference. Now, now the conference was like almost all men, and, and you know they had stories. You know, they, 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 they'd been thrown out of churches, they'd been thrown out of seminaries, they, they'd been dragged through the mud, and I got up. And I looked out at, at those men, almost all men, all the men on the floor, I mean, who were voting, were all men. And I looked out at them, and I said, you know, it just breaks my heart the way that you were treated, just listening to your stories. I said, but I want you to know, if you'd been women, you never would have been there to be thrown out in the first place. <laughs> the next year, general conference again. I was approved for licensing. I'd been a uh, Salvation Army <laughs> candidate for, for uh, to be an officer. I, I withdrew myself because I, I knew I was a lesbian. But uh, it was the second uh, conference that I had been there. And all of these men are coming up to me and saying, well, how do we get women in the church? I mean, because the, the, you know, the gay community was separated. We had women's bars, we had men's bars, and, and uh, we, we didn't really know each other that well. So I got up and I said, well, getting women in the church is a lot like the old recipe for rabbit stew. First, you catch the rabbit. I said, and when a woman walks into your church, you don't put her into the kitchen to wait on the man. I says, if you want women in the church, you've got to have women doing things and they're being seen and then women will come. Okay, so we, we went through that. Third general conference. 
Atlanta, Georgia. This is every year. We had, you know, uh, we, we didn't have any traditions or, you know, to say it better, we had many, many, many traditions. <laughs> <laughs> because we came from everywhere, all the, everyone was represented in Metropolitan <laughs> Community Church. But in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, the bylaws were written as they were at the time. All, you know, the, the, the ministers were he, the deacons were he, the board members were he. And I stood up at the beginning of the conference and I said, Reverend Troy, I said, I'd like to make a motion that all of the he's in these bylaws be changed to he or she. And Troy looked right back at me and he said, Frida Smith, he says, we don't do business that way. He says, we change our bylaws line by line. And if you want to change anything, you stand up and you make the move. So I went through that conference everywhere. <laughs> I stood up on every line and I changed, I made the motion. Now, let's say the voting members, you know, almost all male. I mean, they were men. And I'd pop up and uh, I, I'd make the motion, you know, instead of he, the, the, the but it's he or she or however it went. All day long, I was a total pain in the neck. <laughs> But at the end of the day, the bylaws were changed. Every little line of the bylaws. Yeah. Voted by the men. There weren't enough women that, that we would be able to even change anything at all. Uh, but then, the next day, we were going to elect a new board of elders. We, we, the church had grown, MCC was growing, and it was very exciting. And uh, they were going to expand the board of elders from four to seven. So as the discussion was going on, I'm almost through, Jim, Very don't hit cool. me. <laughs> she is my elder. I'm an elder, but she's, she's the elder. Okay. <laughs> Well, anyway, they were expanding the board of elders. So they had a slate of nominated elders, and someone jumped up on the floor and says, I nominate Frida Smith. And Troy looks at me, and he said, do you accept? And, you know, it scared me to death. But then, you know, it, it, it's a position you're in. If you're pushing for women to be involved everywhere, and then all of a sudden you're offered a position, and you don't know if you're able to even fulfill that position. But I, I thought, well, I have to do it. You know, I, I, so uh, I was elected to the Board of Elders by a congregation of men. Troy looked at this late, and he said, Smith? I didn't know Willie Smith was running. <laughs> But anyway, I was elected at, at the general conference as uh, uh, the uh, uh, as an elder in the denomination, and we just went on from there. We did inclusive language, and I'd say that some of the best feminists in the world were the men of Metropolitan Community <laughs> Church. So we want to take questions, questions. right? Can I take this microphone out to the audience? Yeah? yeah. All right. Questions, friends? You're the best. Oh, I talk really loud. I, I was just wondering, thank you very much for just such rich history. I'm Bishop Zachary Jones of Unity Fellowship Church Movement. And I want to know, in, in those years, uh, and I hate to put a kind of a cloud over such a powerful and rich history. But do you recall any uh, cases of gay men being sick that resembled AIDS prior to the Fire Island uh, information that we have? I do not. On the question of AIDS, in our uh, uh, MCC's general conference in 1981 in Houston, Texas, we got the word that two men, one in New York, one in California, were sick with a, a, a mysterious disease they called GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. And we left 
that conference in Houston not knowing that we were going to face the biggest challenge that I, I, I can believe that any church within the last century has faced. Hi, good morning. I'm Rick Husky from Affir uh, one of the founders of Affirmation. Uh, Nikki and the rest of you, I'm curious, how did you keep track in the beginning of your members? I know I had, was in a situation where I went with Gene Leggett in a car in a, in a sort of a journey to the East Coast to try to f find other uh, gay United Methodist ministers and, and laity, and it was a journey, uh, uh, an odyssey of sorts. Uh, we didn't have, of course, as mentioned, we, there wasn't an email or texting or whatever. So how did you keep track? And did you have questions of security for however it was that you were creating your lists? Ask me that question again <laughs> and a little bit louder. Just in the beginning, when you collected the names of your members, how did you do that, and, and how did that grow? How did you uh, keep track of that? And were you concerned that somehow documents would fall into the hands of, of uh, those that were uh, against what you were doing? Um, <clears throat> that I could remember, the only way of communicating at that time was by phone, okay? Um, as far as documents, um, I don't think uh, we had a lot of um, information that would incriminate our membership. Um, a lot of times, we, for example, my real name is not Nikki, um, but it is uh, my confirmation, I got it from my confirmation name. Because if we knew each other's real name, then we could be asked, do you know so-and-so? And you could honestly say, no, I don't. So we went by nickname. Can I respond to that too, please? Uh, one of the things, one thing we did in the United Church of Christ is from the very beginning, the UCC Gay Caucus included heterosexual members. In fact, the, uh, the woman who went with me to the first General Synod, Rachel Barnsley, um, went because she said heterosexual people need to see that they need to be part of this as well. So we had, from the very beginning, uh, a membership of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and heterosexual members. And I would also say that um, at our first General Synod, we just put out a mailing list, uh, list for people to sign up. We got 64 names at our first effort to attract some members. Uh, but because, of, because the coalition has always been, anybody in the United Church can become a member of the coalition. I think that was a very important thing for us to do to protect uh, the uh, LGBT people in the coalition. So this is Nancy Wilson. I, I, I remember Troy Perry saying, well, he started MCC so he would have a place to go to church uh, and to minister uh, very humbly without a sense of, you know, how are you changing the world? And I wonder if you could reflect and think back to your much younger selves than did you have a sense that you would not only be changing things maybe in your church or your locale, but that you know, 50 years later, people all over the world would have, would would uh, in speaking so many different languages, we would have an LGBT faith community and allies all over the world. Did you have any sense when you were young of destiny or a sense of beyond just the immediate? And what did that feel like? Chuck, Chuck wants you that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you look like you're, you're going to answer. Chuck. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah. Do you have something you want to say? Well, I might. <laughs> Just an addend, a, a, a addenda to what I said before is when Joanne Chadwick and I first went to the California Hall and observed the police photographing everybody and then the first arrests were made, the spirit moved me yeah. to go back home and get my little pony camera 
and come back and photograph the police photographing us. The result was this little camera only took eight pictures at a time, and then you had to change films. In addition to that, each flashbulb had a flashbulb connected to it, so you had to put in a new flashbulb with each picture you took. When the evening came to a close, an hour before it was actually supposed to end, because people were now panicking, afraid that mass arrests would be made, they started to leave. And when they did, one of the clergy would spread wide his jacket and trap all these drag queens underneath him to get out to the car. After doing this about two times, a police officer came and said, if you do that again, you will be arrested for interfering with an officer in the line of duty. So the clergy had to stop doing that. At the very end, I was the last person who left. And suddenly, it was quiet. I looked at Joe and I said, you take Patrick, a member of my parish, and go home. I'm going to walk home. And it's at that point I began to understand the connectedness between the various justice ministries that we all, that we all have. Because as I went down, the rage just swelled up inside of me. And as I walked back through the tenderloin, I would take the, an individual flash bulb out of my pocket and smash it against the building as I went along. And then suddenly I looked across the street <coughs> and two police officers were in a lobby of a hotel. And I hated them for no particular reason because of the injustice that I had suddenly seen. Yeah. And for the first time I really understood what our black brothers and sisters had experienced in a similar manner over the years. I walked on home and there was a fence outside my apartment building and I stood there and I just wept. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I said to myself, what the hell are you allowing these people to do to you? So I did the most important thing. I went upstairs where Joe and my parishioner were waiting and I fixed a drink. <laughs> And then the phone rang, and it was Ted McAvena, and he said, we're calling a, a press conference tomorrow morning. Will you be there? And that's the picture that you will see on the exhibit table over here in the other hall of the seven clergy at that press conference the next morning. Mm. And once again, it made all the difference in the world. Nancy, I want to respond to your question because I got a glimmer when I was, uh, when I was ordained. I got a glimmer um, because the news coverage of my ordination was international. And as a result of that, I got letters from all over the world from young people saying, oh my God, I, uh, are you, like, are you real, you know? Uh, I had never, I never, they had, can I come live with you? I mean, there was, I mean, it was an amazing assortment of yeah. letters of, of folks who were, and from clergy people who were saying, I never thought I'd live to see something like this happen. And that was my glimmer. I just, I thought, oh, wow, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. I thought that I was just, you know, following my vocation. Uh, I didn't realize that my vocation would end up uh, you know, having some such a worldwide effect just through the simple act of asking to be ordained. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. There was a question. Another sure, question. yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Lena Landstrom. I was born in 1993. <laughs> cool. So I know these stories uh, from reading about them. Uh, long after the fact and so reading history it's a lot about piecing a puzzle of context and what happened when and mm -hmm. and um, I was just and you've been speaking a little bit about like how you know about the work of one another but I was curious how much did you know about what was going on outside of your own little bubble um, and both inside the church and outside of the church did you know, uh, Bill, when you 
came out, did you know about the events that happened um, with the California dance and uh, I'm thinking Glide Memorial Church, all of that. Did you know about Troy Perry and MCC? How much did you know about the work of one another and how did that affect uh, your choices and your work? We were all in California, so we all knew about all that. So I heard, I heard Frida talk about an incident in Idaho that sparked her to come to California. Can you do that quick? Uh, you notice he said quick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I was uh, a freshman at Idaho State College in Pocatello, Idaho, uh, when uh, uh, Boise, uh, the uh, newspaper in Boise put out this headline uh, uh, that about, uh, anyway, there's the largest gay raid in Idaho. If you've ever read the Boys of Boise, it was all over the headlines. It was in Time magazine. Uh, men were arrested in Boise. Uh, one of them received a life sentence for being gay. And <laughs> that's when I left Idaho. <laughs> and, what, and what year was that? Not to date you, but... Uh, well, go ahead and date uh, me. That, uh, I, that would have been, uh, I was a freshman, uh, 1953, 1954. Great. Well, so, Nancy. Maybe One of our early think, contacts was with David Sint of Presbyterian Church yeah. of, of memory. <laughs> um, in Philadelphia, I got invited often to Dignity and Integrity and other such groups to answer the question, why aren't the women here? And I would usually say, just look around and see why. But, <laughs> yeah. but we all did meet together. Uh, we had, you know, our, I was doing the, uh, the Gay Caucus newsletter and keeping that, that list of, of people that got it. And we had all of the other groups listed on that. Uh, the Brother Mennonite you mentioned, and, and the Quaker groups, and all of those. We all really did keep in touch with each other and, and knew what was going on. Um, individually, we would know the, the gay community outside of the church in whatever manner individuals did. But yes, we knew the world that was around us, for sure. We were on everybody's, we were on each other's mailing yeah. lists. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, one of the yeah. things, when I gave my papers to Pacific School of Religion, one of the things I gave them were pretty complete sets of newsletters from the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the, um, the Mennonite Council. And, and so there's, there's like complete sets in the archives at Pacific School of Religion, which they may or may not have discovered yet. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but that's, I, Del Martin said to me once, don't ever throw anything away. And of course, we all know she was very wise. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I took it to heart. And I, and I just started throwing things in boxes. And, and uh, you know, when I, was, when I decided to give my papers uh, to PSR, uh, you know, all that stuff was there. So I thought, well, someday some very bright young person in this room is going to be working on a doctorate degree and decide they're going to do a, a dissertation about about this LGBT religious movement. And these papers could be not necessarily my own personal ones, but especially these newsletters could be very, very helpful to them. All these <coughs> mimeograph papers that we yeah. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. <laughs> A lost art. So we're going to have to stop, I hate to say, uh, but even though we haven't finished, as Bishop Kelly used to say, um, we are going to stop. So we're going to ask one more time if you would appreciate this panel. We're going to end with uh, one more chant since we've been introducing intersectionality all week long. We're going to add one more. Uh, no hate, no fear, immigrants are welcome here. Can we add that to our, our repertoire? 
no hate, no, no fear. fear. Immigrants are welcome here, no hate, no fear. Immigrants are welcome here. One more time, hate, no fear. Immigrants are welcome here. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.